Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Happy New Year to you and to all who are listening in tonight. Yeah, Happy New Year. That was a, a great way to end the year if you're an Oilers fan. What is that, four in a row now? Five in a row. Five in a row. Wow. They went, they went back to backs in New Jersey and uh, Madison Square oh, and all for the yeah. break. And then they swept California. And aren't those oh. sweet words to hear? California <laughs> dreaming. Bruce, um, yeah, that's fantastic because they have a really tough game against Los Angeles. They could have gone either way, and uh, they won that one. Tonight was never really in doubt. I mean, there was um, the first period, you know, the Oilers kind of sawed it off barely against uh, the Ducks, and after that, we're at, the Oilers were absolutely dominant in a 7-2 victory. Bruce, the grade-A shots in this game were 23-14 um, to 14 for the Oilers. Wow. The subset of 5 11 Alarm shots were 14 to 8 for the Edmonton wow. Oilers. So a big night on the attack for the Oilers, especially in the second period where they absolutely dominated the play. Bruce, we'll go with our two good things, two bad things, two numbers, and one conundrum podcast. But but we will um, do two good things each because there were so many good things in tonight's game. Uh, but we'll go quick. We'll go quick because it's New Year's and... Uh, Everyone wants to listen to this before uh, the clock ticks to midnight, mm-hmm. so they can the quickly listen drops. to this. And we're the same. We want to. We got important things to do, like sit on the couch and watch a movie or something like that, or right you know what? What us people our age do? <laughs> <laughs> what I've done for the last thirty years at New Year's. All right, Bruce, I'll go first because um, I'm going to call this the goal of the year. It was a goal so freaking spectacular that they had to search the memory banks to get a to to, to be able to, to get a replay that actually showed the play. It was just so unusual a goal that, you, that the, the play went so fast, the passing went so fast, that they couldn't even get it on camera because uh, the goal came from such an unexpected shot. And, and nonetheless, even though it, it came from an un, unexpected shot, it was definitely a five-alarm shot. It was it was the kind of shot you would expect this player in that situation to make at least a third of the time because he is such an amazing shooter of the puck. He is the most amazing shooter uh, of um, the 2020s in the NHL. I mean, uh, Ovechkin obviously takes the first two decades, I think, of the century. Leon Dreisaitl, though, that was, I don't think we're going to see a more interesting, alarming, astonishing, and excellent goal this year. Um, the play starts with the Oilers cycling the puck around the offensive zone, this line that they've created, that uh, Coach K has created, of Dreisaitl, McLeod, and Fogel. It's so good that I bet you even Dreisaitl isn't asking to be put on Connor McDavid's line anymore right now. <laughs> Not that I ever knew that happened, but I just always assumed there was a fair degree of lobbying. But I think Leon might be very, very happy um, with his new line mates because they're rolling and um, they were rolling on this shift. They were winning pucks um, and finally Fogel wins it and he makes a, he, he protects it very well and he makes a nice dish at the top of the blue line to Darnell Nurse. And this is, this seems like a, a staple right now of the Oilers attack, Bruce, is the Oilers cycling it out towards the blue line and kind of passing it backhand um, to the guy going in the other direction. It's it's almost like we're watching the um, the Red Army team from the 1970s, the way they wheel around the offensive zone and drop off pucks to each other. It's extremely impressive, honestly. It's it's a whirlwind of attacking hockey. So the puck went to Nurse, who had his head up. Darnell Nurse, um, he's uh, been playing a lot of heads-up hockey when he's got the puck on his stick these days. He does not carry it so much. But he is moving it well, and he makes a brilliant diagonal pass. Uh, he's up at the blue line, Darnell Nurse, on the, um, I guess that would be the left side of the net. 
and he passes it all the way down to the right corner, right on the goal line where Leon Dreisel is standing in the corner. This is not a scoring position for most players. For 99.9% of players in the NHL, nobody regularly scores from there. But we've now seen Dreisaitl do this at least twice. This is the second time. It, there might be another one. When, and I'll ask you in a second when the first one was. Anyway, he he absolutely just hammered that in the net. It was a brilliant shot from the from the <laughs> corner pocket right into the net. What a goal. What a play by Leon Dreisaitl. Yeah, one of the cameras actually caught up to the play. The one, uh, uh, I think, from the other side. And it had a good mic sound of Leon catching that. And uh, and it just sounded like, um, uh, you know, um, a line drive hit by, you know, uh, Rod Blad, Blatty or something, you know, just just a <laughs> rocket off the bat, you know, and, and uh, just ripped it into the net. His skates, I think his skates were just above the goal line, but he was practically over by the boards. Yeah. Remember, he did get one one time where both of his skates were behind the red line and only his stick was out <laughs> and he buried it from the, from the corner and had people talking. But he scored quite a few goals from various low angles over there. And it's just hard for the goalie to get all the way across. Like there was one great a- low angle that showed Gibson desperately, John Gibson desperately trying to get over there. And the puck just whizzed inside the, you know, the uh, what for dry saddle was the near side post. But from, you know, the angle he was shooting from, the two posts were practically uh, right on top of one another. You know, it wasn't like there was a six foot gap. It was more like a six inch gap. Boom. And poor Gibson just couldn't quite get there. He was uh, just a little beleaguered tonight, uh, John Gibson. <laughs> he was. He was wishing he had been traded to the Oilers. He, um, he, you know, Dry Settle. He, you don't often see him smile during a game, but he had a. Bit, he could not contain the grin on his face after that goal. And, and mm-hmm. I mean, oh, wow. who can blame him? I mean, what a play! Like to execute mm-hmm. a play like that. Yeah. My goodness gracious, what a play. Bruce, what's your first good thing? Yeah, well, I'm going to go with the guy who uh, picked up the secondary assist on that play by getting the puck smartly to nurse in the first place. And that was one of just one of five points for Warren Fogle in this game. His prior career high was three. And he just blew that out of the water tonight with a variety of uh, points, two of them goals. Uh, so he led the Oilers in uh, goals and assists. Uh, he was the only two goal scorer. He was the only three assist scorer. Uh, he also led the team in shots on net, uh, in shot share. He had a great game. He was all over it. And uh, he had, uh, let's see, now McLeod from Fogel. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a really nifty uh uh, goal mouth pass, as I recall, and uh, from behind the net. Uh, I think Leon got ripped off out of a point on that one. Uh, he and did. Then, I agree, Bruce. And then that that's sec- second time on this road trip. Uh, uh, the one you just described, dry settle from Nurse and Fogel, and Fogel scored two in a row. Uh, one from uh, from uh, Nurse and Brown, the other from McLeod and Drysaddle, the whole line connected on, on that one. And then uh, the last goal of the game, again, it was Fogel to Drysaddle with a cross-ice feed to uh, Brett Kulak, who managed to pick the far corner. Did you call that a grade-A shot, David? No, that, think that, that was, was not a, a grade-A shot. I didn't, think it, was. Shot, I didn't no. think it was. I mean, it was a cross-ice pass, but I think yeah, that one but, should have been stopped. But yeah. anyway, it was a... Uh, uh, an exclamation point on a on a pretty fine night for uh, uh, for Mr. Fogel. I I just liked his you know his energy and uh, it, the puck was going in the right direction when those guys were out there. He was on for five goals for I mean all the goals I think all of the goals were at even strength in this game weren't they? All yeah. five on five, and they were. Uh, uh, there, I mean, one was scored right after an Oilers power play had just expired. Yeah, but, yeah. 
we would count it as a power play, but the, you know, yeah, the guy exactly. the guy was out the penalty box door, but not in the play. There was no effect in the play. Yeah. But anyway, that was uh, great pass uh, from Nurse there to Fogel uh, on that oh, one. Yes. Yeah, just a beautiful pass from Darnell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to yeah. jump forward, David, to take the lead. Now that's my second good thing, Darnell Nurse. And I loved his game tonight on the on the back end. And uh, not a perfect game. There was a few uh, uh, defensive miscues. And I think on one of the goals, he was caught out. And, you know, all he did on the night was end up plus four as well uh, with a couple of just beautiful assists. And I thought some some pretty solid defensive plays and stops. And he earned points in my, my book for nailing Trevor Zegras. Yes. And I wish he would have done it again after Zegras took two different real cheap from behind stick shots at two different Oilers. He cross-checked James Hamblin right in the numbers. And then he chopped Ryan McLeod in the back of the legs after the 7-2 goal in this weird... There was a couple of... This was kind of a, a, a nasty, fractious game, I would call it. And there was a few weird altercations, like Ryan Strom trying to rain punches down on Matthias Ekholm, like, what? And um, this one in the end, where uh, where uh, Zeke was chopped McLeod down and and dry it speared him. Actually, they called it spearing four minutes. And Dry Subtle came in and dragged him, just grabbed him like any good teammate would. And somehow he got two and ten for for his involvement. Somehow, uh, yeah, Mark. Uh, Janmark, he got two and ten. There's a different two and ten that Janmark got when uh, Gudis gave him the business with the stick and somehow uh Janmark was the only penalties out of that one and it was there was some bizarre stuff going on i thought they were they, they did all right in the department that i hold dear which is having each other's back when things get rough you want to see the teammates step up and i thought they did just a fine job of that and uh oh, anyway uh, uh nurse was uh part of that brigade as usual and uh he is uh, uh uh he brings a lot of intangibles you know and i don't think he gets credited for for some of them and there's obviously way more to the game than intangibles but you got to have some of those things somewhere in the lineup and uh he brings a few of them and him uh him stepping up and and uh crunching Zegers with the hit of the game. So that's going to get a plus one in his grade right there. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Zegers is a... I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. Yeah. He's, he's, yeah. he's pretty dirty. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, you know, Bruce, with Fogel, just going to make one comment. You know, we've yep. been talking about him f- for some time now. Going back to last season, we first identified him as playing really strong two-way hockey in the last couple months of the season. And one of the reasons we do this work on grade A shots, you know, looking for who's making the contributions and who's not making, you know, limiting mistakes is to kind of identify players who are not, not necessarily putting a lot of points up, but are getting their jobs done as two-way players. And I think our work there really helped us pick out Fogel early on as someone who's a strong two-way hockey player. And he has been all all of 2013. He's been he's been an outstanding winger playing two way hockey. So much so, like his contract's up after this year. And we're gonna have to. It's gonna be an interesting uh, discussion about what's gonna happen there. Like it's gonna people are gonna start to want this guy to come back, which a lot of people have been criticizing the signing for a long time now. But this year, Bruce Warren Fogel has yeah. been he's been more than earning his money, and now he's mm-hmm. finally on a line with with a guy who can put in the puck in the net or distribute the puck for a goal and he's starting to put up some points and um yeah warren fogel is a hell of a hockey player right now and he has been for a full year so um good for him yeah well nights like this i mean well i should say nights like this there's been one like this yeah. five points the night like this um, but padding his numbers the way that he did two three five plus four uh with a bunch of shots uh his his value his asking price just went up by a significant amount yeah just with this game like 
uh, like I might put like 0.5 of a million dollars on his AAV or might even put an extra year of term wherever he goes. And it's not necessarily going to be here because yeah. the Oilers don't have a lot of dough no. and he might price himself out, you know. Uh, yeah. But at this point, he's got uh, seven goals and 12 assists. So he's up to 19 points. And what are we, 40% of the way through the season? So not quite on pace for 50 points, but virtually all of them at, uh, you know, even strength, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, you look around the league and you see guys like Barkley Goodrow getting paid big bucks. And uh, sometimes these guys... Uh, uh, do get valued. Be nice to win a cup first, of course, but uh, sure would. It, you know what I mean. It's it's. Uh, uh, I just think you know he just he padded his numbers sufficiently in this game that you know he sort of moved up a class in terms of uh, where he'll be on the list of desirable free agents next summer. Well, if he sticks with Drysdale and McLeod, and this is got to be making a huge impression on the coach, the play of this mm-hmm. line. Um, you know, when Holloway comes back, and they if they can have a line of Holloway, Kane, and Brown, um, I don't know if Holloway's capable of playing center, but we might see three lines that are going pretty good, Bruce, come playoff time. And my um, my second good thing is Connor Brown. I think tonight we finally saw the real Connor Brown, the Connor Brown that is worth the contract that he got. The Connor Brown, um, who was a really good player, in Ottawa and Toronto uh, and in the world championships, as you mentioned. And um, he made five major contributions to grade A shots. He got one assist. You know, he made a, first of all, a great, DeHarnay put it on net. He tipped it and he almost scored. It was a great tip shot. And there was a scramble around the net. On the power play, um, or on the, I guess it's an even strength goal officially, Fogel's goal, which came a few minutes after that off Nurse's great pass. He had won the puck a couple times on the power play, and he made he made a really nice pass. He was making nice passes all along there and passed it to Nurse, which was a good pass um, to help set up that goal. Uh, next up uh, for Fogel, he shorthanded. To Janmark. He goes into Janmark. They rush up the ice mm-hmm. two on one, and he threads it right over to Janmark. for oh, a great that's very time. nice. And he and nearly, then, um, but he okay. just barely cleared the rebounder. That would have been a tap in for. Yeah. It was a real good emergency clearance by the demon. And then he uh, made a he got the puck behind the net and made a nice pass to uh, James Hamlet in the slot for a one timer shot, which was uh, he held the puck just long enough. Brown did to open up the lane a bit and uh, threaded it over, and Hamlet almost scored. So. I just thought he had a he had a, at least a good game. Like you wouldn't call it a great game because the points weren't there. Like, yeah. but it was a good game, and it's he doesn't have many. Like we we rate player point. one to ten. Yeah. He doesn't have many sevens this year, Connor. He's getting one one he's, tonight. He's getting. Yeah. And I'm he already really decided. <laughs> so, I know Definitely people are a good down on game. Him. People are di- a lot of criticism of him, and I and I get it. But sometimes patience is in order. And if this is the player we're going to start to see the rest of the year, Bruce. Bring it on. That would, Yeah, I hear you. All right, your bad thing, Bruce. Yeah, uh, I think you're going to zero in on part of this. I'm just going to talk a little bit about sloppy defensive play at times. And yeah. I think Oilers got pretty lucky on a few plays right around the net where Anaheim either whiffed or they hit the post on one where the – Puck was turned over from a bad pass from behind the net. Uh, there was a couple of, of um, sloppy rebounds or p- plays where, um, you know, there was one shot that hit Calvin Pickard and went through him and just barely missed the far post. Uh, you know, and there there was just a few sort of gasp kind of plays as to. Uh, it seemed like it should have been under control, and it just was little bits of sloppiness here and there. And uh, Pickard had, I mean, I don't want to say he's my bad thing because he's definitely not, but he, he's got, um, he's he's not the tidiest goalie. And there was a couple of times with, uh, you know, the puck squirting free on him and stuff and it created a little bit of chaos. And then he makes the stops. So he's going to get a good grade based on making all the stops because he stopped uh, uh, 28 out of 30 tonight, 933. 
he could have helped himself a couple of times, and uh, there was other times where he helped out by freezing the puck and letting him get off. But I, it's I I don't I mean he's the focal point as the goalie. I don't want to single out individual players because there was a little bit of a team malaise. And it was just a couple of times, sort of middle part of the first period, and there were some real ugly moments in the third. I thought, of course, the, the orders were were largely in command at that time, but I mean, because they were in command, there's not a lot of bad things to necessarily choose from. You know, they won seven two. Yeah. <laughs> My bad thing is is related to what you're saying, as you mentioned. And it's like the game this game was a little bit in doubt early on because they got a nice one goal lead on a great play by the drive side of line. Leon chugs it up the ice. Just great play, puck protecting and stick handling and and uh Fogel put it from behind that I think to McLeod and it was a nice mm. goal. But then they gave it away, and it was on a it was on one of those plays. We've seen this not hardly at all um, lately, but it defined their game early in the year. Kind yeah. of these lazy, unfocused defensive plays, and this was one uh, again by some of their veteran players. The puck gets shot into the Edmonton end, and and Nurse, he's just a little lackadaisical going back to get it. He should easily beat the other player to the puck if he's charging back. You know, as defensemen are taught to do, charge back fast for the puck. He's just a little, he just kind of cruises. And the and the four checker catches up to him. So instead of being able to, to gather in the puck and take it around the net, he's under a little pressure to make the play. So instead of making a good play, as Paul Coffey wants, he just chops the puck over to CC, And it's it's a turnover. It, and it's an unnecessary turnover because he wasn't sharp. He wasn't getting back there fast. And um, it's the kind of mental error that I I don't like to see uh, for the owners make because it's the kind of mental error which has cost, which cost them the Vegas series. And they can't keep making those mistakes. And the day they, they all decide they're not making them anymore is the day they win the Stanley Cup. It doesn't end there, though. CC loses the battle on the boards. The puck goes behind the net, and Leon cruises in, and he doesn't play the puck. His stick isn't on the ice. His stick isn't on the ice. If his stick is, if he's if he's going for stick on puck, he stops that pass out front. But he doesn't. He has it in the air. And again, this is another mental error, defensive mental error. You know, the day Leon Drysaddle decides no one's beating him on defense is the day the Oilers win the Stanley Cup. Seriously, he is such a fantastic hockey player. But his defensive fundamentals are sometimes lacking. They don't have to be. He can change his mind. He can change the way he plays. He can cut out this kind of play. So it's 1-1. And you just don't know what's going to happen when it's 1-1. A team like Anaheim can suddenly, like they had a hot streak at the start of the year. Mm -hmm. You don't want to let them back in the game. You want to crush them. And in the second period, they made up their mind. And Leon, it's, it's harsh to pick on Leon in some ways because he, so, he was fantastic this game. It was one of his best games of the year. He's leading his own line. He's crushing it on the attack. But, you know, I'm, I'm guess one of these people who want, you know, the perfection. full 200, not perfection, but <laughs> not obvious defensive mistakes right. that can be avoided. I thought I Pickard maybe could have cut that pass out. He could have helped himself too. That came yeah, right, maybe was. right maybe through the edge of the blue paint. Yeah. But uh, it was... Uh, and then he stopped the first one, but the rebound kind of went sideways, and CC wasn't quite able to to deal with the uh, yeah the guy in front. That was so. a tough play for CC, but yeah, that that is it was mainly uh, I thought it was mainly on Darnell and Leon mm -hmm. that goal against maybe Pickard. You're right, I didn't really notice, I didn't think about that mm -hmm. cutting it out because that's a bit of a problem with the Oilers goalies, both Skinner and Pickard. Like they both have a little bit of trouble sometimes mm -hmm. when the puck's in close, not not pouncing on it with their stick like we saw for instance Vasilevsky do so brilliantly in that uh, stellar performance against Gooders your number well, yeah they can't um, I, I think it's fair to say they uh, I was expecting the trouble in this game and 7-2 to is not a lot of trouble because just the short turnaround after such an intense game last night with so many guys logging so many high minutes Remember last night we were talking about all the fours playing 24 minutes and the D-men all in the high 20s. So I'm, I'm just going to go right back there and 
tonight's ice time for the Oilers. The leader was Nurse at 24 minutes. Uh, Bouchard played 22. No other Oiler played as many as 20, uh, including all of the forwards. And every forward except for Adam Ernie played at least 10 minutes in this game. Ernie played 9:21, so he just came up a. Though he didn't get second power play minutes and he didn't quite get there, but it was a really much more balanced distribution and that was uh, readily predictable. Frankly, I predicted it this morning that they, you know they would need a four line three defense pair effort uh, and a good showing from the backup goalie because the big guys have carried so much of the mail last night. So. It's uh, it's heartening to see that the, I think the team mostly responded, and, and uh, the depth guys uh, the depth guys did their part. I mean, Matthias Janmark, that one defensive play he made in the oh, yeah. kill there, huge. Where he, he saved saved basically a sure goal, and yeah. you know, and that's as good as scoring a goal. I mean, it doesn't show up under his stats, but in the moment, it was huge. Indeed. Bruce, my number is 0.904. That is now Calvin Pickard's goals against, or excuse me, save percentage, goals against average. Save percentage. That'd be a hell of a goals against average. Save percentage. Um, That is, Bruce, above league average. I think Liebig is 903 or 904. It's right in there. It's 903 the last time I checked, and of course it changes from day to day a little bit. Yeah, so so that's exactly what you're hoping for from a backup goalie, isn't it? That is, if he if you have a backup goalie who's league average in save percentage, you're smiling. And you know the good news about that is this: that uh, we hear from people like Elliot Friedman on his on his podcast that the goalie market is ugly, and some teams are just demanding the you know the sun, the moon, and all the stars for their you know their goalie who's mediocre, and. Mm-hmm. The owners have got to be looking at it. Now, I know uh, our Cult of Hockey colleague, Kurt Levins, wrote that he's he thinks the owners must have another goalie. Um, well, Calvin Pickard has a say in that. And if he keeps playing like this, a part of playing like this is when the, when the puck squeaks through his legs, it goes wide. Um, but if he keeps a 904 save percentage or, or thereabouts, anything above nine, essentially... I don't know if the orders, the orders have other, they might have other needs that they're going to need to ha- have addressed in a trade. I think they can only make probably one deal. Like I know there's talk of two, three deals. I don't know. They, I could see them maybe making two, like one player who will help and then one depth player. But um, it might not be a goalie that they need with Olivier Rodrigue playing so well in the HL, having the, uh, or if if not the highest, one of the highest save percentages in the AHL right now. With Stuart Skinner coming on, playing like he did last year when he was playing well, and Pickard being able to, to step in and play some games, we'll see what happens. I just think it's, it's an unknown, and I, I don't think it's for sure, personally, that they're going to be trading for a goalie. It's one of those things where you you monitor it. You see how things go in January. And you see how things go right to the trading deadline or a couple of weeks before then. And then if you need to make a trade, you'll you'll be making one. But they may not be trading for a goalie. That might not happen. And it's mainly dependent on Stuart Skinner. But Pickard's going to have a say as well. Well, I could just claim a goalie on waivers. is two there today. Elias Samsonov. Hey, he's right there, man. Three oh, man. $3.55 million and uh, eight... 60 something save percentage. I understand they're taking a different tact with Ilya Samsonov than the than yeah. the uh Oilers took with Jack mm-hmm. Campbell sitting into the minors and having him take all the minutes up. What are they doing with Samsonov in Toronto? They're actually sending him down to not play games for a while and just strictly work work on his game, like people always say when somebody's sent out he needs to work on his game. Well, he does. Uh, he's been brutal, Ilya Samsonov, like worse than Campbell to my yeah. eye. Yeah, yeah. And that's saying something. And uh, he, uh, uh, they're going to work with him on the ice and and uh, in the video room, but they're not going to use him in games, is what they said for uh, at least the first week, and then they'll they'll see because he's a real reconstruction project as well. And there's a few of them around the league. I mean, uh, we've seen. Uh, 
Of course, Campbell waived. Andy Ranta, a very reliable long-term veteran goalie, got waived. Uh, he's back in the league now. Uh, but today, Samsonov, Eric Comrie, who's you know an established backup goalie, got waived. And it's uh, there's been a few goalies that are just having a hell of a time with it. And it's a seller's market, except for nobody seems to be selling. So, because they're asking too much. Yeah. Well. They think it's a seller's market, and they're yeah. holding out for more. But the you know the deals aren't happening yet. But uh, there's a couple of places where something's got to give. Yeah, one of them uh, being Edmonton, according to Kurt. And yeah, a lot of people you know it's agree very possible, Kurt. certainly very possible. I was just checking Samsonov to see with if, if he oh. had signed for more than one year. I was hoping he had like no, a five it was year. A, it was a one year. Uh, <laughs> Uh, arbitration. They took him to arbitration, and uh, oh. it's that process where they they try and keep the price down by telling the arbitrator everything that's wrong with the guy. And sometimes it doesn't end well because Samson, I believed every word. Yeah, yeah. Well, they said I suck, and I guess I got just proven it. <laughs> so where are we now? We conundrum. Conundrum. Mm. Okay, the conundrum is Jay Woodcroft is sitting here watching all this probably. Bruce, what do you think he's thinking? And this is all speculation. We can't read Jake Woodcroft's mind. But what do you what do you suspect he's thinking? Oh, I'm sure it's supremely frustrating to see the Oilers um, executing better, but also, you know, I think some of it's just lucky. They've been luckier. They've gotten more breaks, and at the beginning of the season, they weren't getting any breaks. Seemed like every puck that was would bounce over someone's stick would get immediately stuffed into the back of Edmonton's net. And some of it's just you know regression to the mean, uh, and some of it's you know Edmonton delivering what he envisioned, but not quite in the manner because he's no longer the guy putting out the game plan. Uh, mostly, I think if he's if I'm Jay Woodcroft, I'm looking forward. And saying, well, I helped build this team. Come on, Ottawa, make me an offer. <laughs> Come on, Steady yeah. Steve, who got hired today as the GM and CEO. I think he had a, he had a multiple title with uh, Ottawa Senator Steve Steos as of today. So congrats to him, longtime fo- former Oiler. Yeah, it's it's hard to speculate on what. And it, like, you know, he's got a winner's mindset, right? Like he's mm-hmm. a professional and he's, and I think you're probably right. He's mainly looking forward and he's probably mainly hoping this team, these players that he worked with do well. Um, so mm-hmm. I'll, I'll just say two human reactions, maybe not NHL coach reactions. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them, one of them would be, um, well, the, the bad luck thing would be galling, would have to be. Yeah. And the the way Some the goalies the way the goalies played under him as compared to the way they're playing now would like he he didn't sign Jack Campbell to that contract but he's the coach who had to he had to give Jack Campbell those starts there was no doubt about it whoever was coaching the owners this year they had to see if Jack Campbell could come back and then Skinner also didn't play well he just wasn't himself and I think they both Campbell and Skinner was a and it was a, because those two goalies were struggling. It was a downward dynamic on the team. So that's got to be, that aspect of it has got to be frustrating. I, I, you know, that would be a normal human reaction. The other super, super frustrating thing, and he'd be, it would be amazing if this thought hasn't crossed his mind, is how how did everybody start out the year injured and now they're playing, and, you know, playing mediocre hockey. So many of the key guys, and now they're healthy and playing like gangbusters. So um, I think that would be another source of frustration. So I'm talking about McDavid, Ekholm, Connor Brown starting tonight, Evander Kane. Connor Brown's actually been trending up for some time, and our numbers have shown that. Um, so there's a number. Uh, Ryan McLeod is another one. All of these guys, and and Kulak even started out poorly for the first two or three or four games before he he he. Uh, so there's just an a, like you know five or six players in this boat who were shadows of themselves Mm -hmm. Ekholm and McDavid in particular like maybe the two key players key defense like the key defenseman and the key forward on the team and um 
that's got to be frustrating too, to know that you lost your job partly because of injuries and bad luck in yeah. that. I'm also going to say that there's, I would, I think uh, an NHL coach's reaction, there might be some humility too in watching this team play right now and seeing the, the free flowing nature that, as I call it, the cough, the confidence, the confidence of these players. Um, there is something a little different about this group of Oilers right now under Knobloch than, than even in, that we saw even maybe in their best times under Woodcroft. In the defensive group, there's a willingness to skate with the puck, get your head up and make plays. Um, this whole thing of, of wheeling in the offensive end, we've seen that in the past. But the extent that we're seeing it now and the, and the way that the defensemen are moving with the puck at the offensive blue line and, and wheeling around and making plays, we didn't see that between Ekholm and Bouchard last year when they were together. Maybe they're just getting more used to each other and that was going to happen under Woodcroft, so you could say that. Um, but I do think there is a little bit of, there is an incredible amount of offensive confidence that, he, that Woodcroft as a coach may be thinking about and thinking, why didn't we quite reach that level right. of offensive creativity when I was the coach and what can I, what could I do uh, to think about that and change? So that happens next time I am a coach. And right. what do you think? Is that a yeah. Well, possibility? yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible to continue learning about yourself when you see the aftermath and, you know, what did other, what did the next guy do different with the same, same, talent core uh to get more out of them. and i agree that the injuries i mean ekholm and, and mcdavid were not themselves yeah. i don't think it really any time during the woodcroft's short tenure in this current season and mcleod really had a had a poor start and the goalies as you say i mean after game 12 which was essentially the game that got uh that was the last straw for um Woodcroft, uh, Stuart Skinner was 854 with one win in uh, in seven starts, uh, and since then uh, he is 13 and four with a 910, and he's got the most wins of any goalie in the National Hockey League. They were talking about that on the broadcast tonight. That he's number one in the league since uh, mid-November for uh, for wins, and he's put up a bunch of solid games in the process, right? So, yeah. And he's uh, 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 he's turned it around, and Pickard is you know competent, which is to say he's a couple cuts above where Jack Campbell was in the early part of the season, and uh, he he kept uh, trying to go with both goalies, Woodcroft, but uh, neither of them was particularly answering the bell, and he was. Uh, Kind of delivered a shorthand this year, and on the other hand, he did get lucky. And, and you know, when he came in, Dave Tippett could look back at the end of that season and say, "Well, I never had Evander Kane scoring a bunch of goals for me, and uh, I never had a healthy Mike Smith." You know, and and there was a few things that changed in the order's favor just around the time Woodcroft took over that made his part of the season stand out probably more than it might have otherwise. So some of it's just the luck of the draw. You know, just short-term trends are just trends until they get someone fired. The fascinating thing, Bruce, is even as, as hot as the others have been under Coach K, they are still three points out of a playoff spot right now, although they have games in hand. Yes, on, uh, But their, their um, points percentage is lower than both Nashville and Arizona. So... Um, they're three points back. They got one game in hand on uh, Arizona, and they've got three games in hand on Nashville. But the orders are in. They're not out of this. This is going to be a battle. It's going to be a major battle. They're going to have to keep winning, and winning, and winning, and winning. The good news is, they're not winning by any kind of fluke. They they have been. They are a dominant team. I mean, the the game against uh, Los Angeles was a coin flip. Uh, maybe even Los Angeles, uh, I think the, uh, Los Angeles did have the better of the scoring chances in that game. And uh, Skinner outplayed Cam Talbot in that game, both in the uh, even time and in the uh, o and overtime and shootout. And that was the difference in the game. 
him and McDavid. But it's going to be a battle right to the end. Well, even if they come home from this series, uh, you know, 2 0 1 1 with an you know, overtime loss or shootout loss in LA, that's still a pretty good outcome. And in the other two games against weaker teams, they just stomped both of them 5 0 and 7 2. And this on top of those back to back wins. I mean, they're coming home with a five game winning streak and it's all on the road. Right? They won five straight road games. It's, you know, it's two different trips, but there was no home games in between. So it's uh, a real nice uh, uh, turnaround in that respect. And they're, they're trending up. And anything I keep hearing from other markets is that, you know, the Edmonton Oilers are not the team we want to be playing right now or in the playoffs or what have you. And kind of wishful thinking that they might miss the playoffs, but uh, uh, I'm not sure that's going to happen. It's not. Bruce, uh, let's leave it there. you got to sure. do some writing tonight. I, I want do. to wish uh, myself, I want to wish Happy New Year's to all the, the faithful, the cult of hockey readers and listeners i i do really believe bruce that we have the smartest sharpest wisest group of hockey fans in the world who listen to this podcast and correspond with us talk to us on twitter sometimes send us uh, nice uh, letters we've got a few nice letters in recent days yes indeed listen to the podcast those are, those are really it's it's really heartening that, that nice people letter are getting... about peter gabriel the other day that was nice after we talked about him <laughs> last cast that was good People like your, what was that Magnus thing? Magnus. Uh, oh, my Magnus Krona. Your Magnus Krona line. <laughs> All right, Bruce. Uh, thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. Happy New Year. <laughs>